This video is for educational and infotainment purposes only. It is not intended to encourage or glorify the use of illegal drugs, violence, or criminal activity in any way. Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo Don Neto, co-founder of the Guadalajara cartel in Mexico, was a farmer if you will, and was principally responsible for a 2,500-acre marijuana plantation that was one of the largest the world had ever seen. It produced a billion dollars, that's billion with a B, in marijuana sales. That was until it all went up in smoke. So what happened? Well, you're about to find out. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you are watching A Lawyer Up. In today's episode, we're going to take a look at the life of Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo, known as Don Neto, who is one of the co-founders of the Guadalajara cartel, who in the 70s and 80s controlled most of the drug trafficking in Mexico along the United States corridor. We're going to talk about his childhood and how he got into and learned the ropes of the drug trade. We're going to talk about how he, with a little help from his friends, founded the Guadalajara Cartel, which united several smaller drug plazas into Mexico's first major drug cartel. We're going to discuss the rise and then the fall of the Guadalajara cartel following its involvement in the death of U.S. DEA agent Kiki Camarena. Finally, we're going to talk about Don Neto's arrest, his trial, his imprisonment, and then his release and where he is today because it ain't jail. If you enjoy the episode, hit that like button for me. If you got a comment, you got something to say, put it in the comment sections below. If you haven't subscribed, what are you waiting for? Smash that subscribe button for me. And you guys know it. I love it when you share my videos on social media. As most of you know, we here at Lawyer Up have partnered with Webull, the online broker that allows you to buy and sell stocks or crypto or whatever you're into directly from your computer or the mobile app on your phone. Webull is free to join. It's free to use. There is no cost to buy or sell, so it's commission-free trading. Better yet, when you sign up and link a bank account and deposit as little as one cent, Webull will give you at least two free stocks worth at least $3 a piece. So it is free money as well. So if you would like to join the over 2 million Webull traders, all you have to do is click on the link in the description below. Happy trading. So Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo Donetto was born in 19... And that is as far as we get before we run into controversy with Don Neto, because even his date of birth is disputed. The DEA says that he was born in 1942, while other sources claim he was born in 1930. Regardless, we know that he was born in the Mexican state of Sinaloa. Specifically, he was born near the city of Badiraguato, which is a tiny little town that has produced a bunch of famous drug lords. In addition to Don Neto, Rafael Caro Quintero, Rafa, his brother Miguel Caro Quintero, El Azul, the Beltran Leva brothers, Pedro Aviles Perez, and El Chapo himself all come from this general area. That is a bunch of very big cartel names from a very small town. Details on Neto's childhood are sparse and very little is known, but we do know he grew up exposed to farming and developed an extensive knowledge thereof. We also know that he became first involved in drug trafficking in Ecuador before he moved his operations back to Mexico where he would team up with Pedro Aviles Perez, AKA Don Pedro. And if you know anything about the history of Mexican drug cartels, it all starts with Don Pedro, also known as El Leon de la Sierra or the Lion of the Sierras, referring to the Sierra Madre mountain range in Mexico wherein he lived and worked. Now, Don Pedro became the first major Mexican drug lord beginning in the late 1960s, and he is considered to be the first generation of Mexican drug smugglers. He was also the first drug lord to use an aircraft to smuggle drugs into the United States. 
second generation traffickers such as Felix Gallardo, Rafael Caro Quintero, Rafa, and Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo Donetto would all go on to say that they learned the trade from Don Pedro. Drug trafficking has drastically changed over the past 50 years. In the beginning, violence was unnecessary and formal organizations were scarce. In fact, if you go back to when Don Neto was just getting his start in Mexico, only two major drug trafficking organizations even existed. Compare that to today where law enforcement identifies the existence of nine separate drug cartels and 36 additional cell groups or gangs that are involved in some way in the Mexican drug trade. But in the 70s, there were only two organizations called Clicas or Clicks that were involved in the drug trade, and they were the Gulf and Aviles' organization. The Gulf Cartel, as it is now called, had been around a lot longer, getting started in the 1930s smuggling alcohol into the U.S. during Prohibition. They operated out of Matamoros, which is right across the border from Brownsville, Texas. They were involved in lots of different types of organized crime, gambling, prostitution, car theft, and they peddled a little heroin. But in the 70s, moving drugs was not a number one area for them. Juxtapose was the Aviles organization with its center of operations among the Sierra Madre mountain range within the Triangulo Dorado or the Golden Triangle region of Chihuahua, Sinaloa, and Durango. It was from this remote location that Don Pedro was able to establish a drug trafficking organization that sowed, cultivated, and distributed mass amounts of contraband. The group primarily trafficked marijuana and heroin, but was also the first to start trafficking cocaine into the United States from South America. As the organization grew, Don Pedro acquired several men under his command, and it is a veritable who's who of future drug lords. In his inner circle was Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, who would later be the leader of the Guadalajara cartel. Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo Don Neto, who oversaw marijuana growing operations and who worked himself up to being the treasurer of Aviles' organization. He counted the money, so obviously he was very trusted by Don Pedro. Don Neto would also be a co-founder of the Guadalajara cartel and would later be among the first to start working with Pablo Escobar in Colombia, moving cocaine into the United States. And there was Rafael Caro Quintero Rafa, who would be the third founder of the Guadalajara cartel. Now, down a rung was a second group of guys that included Pablo Acosta Villarreal, El Zorro de Ojinaga, or the Ojinaga Fox, who would work closely with Don Neto's nephew, Amado Carrillo Fuentes, in the Juarez cartel in Chihuahua. There is Ismael El Mayo Zambala, who would later become one of the founders of the Juarez and the Sinaloa cartels, and Joaquin Guzman, El Chapo, of later Sinaloa cartel fame. Finally, the Ariano Felix brothers and the Beltran Leva brothers were all getting their start at this time with Aviles' organization. So if you ever wondered where all of this drug cartel mess in Mexico got started, it was with Don Pedro. And as I mentioned, back then, at least in the beginning, there really was no violence. I know that is hard to believe with that bunch, but Don Pedro prohibited it. He saw violence as unnecessarily drawing attention to the group and a threat to the business. Don Pedro was able to protect his empire with dollars rather than bullets, brokering a deal with local law enforcement. Now, the deal had two rules. Don Pedro would be given zones of operation where he would be allowed to traffic drugs so long as, number one, he kept the peace, and number two, he was willing to circulate some of the drug money for the benefit of the local economy. And things went well during the early and mid-70s. As the group's success grew, several other traffickers or drug plazas began to spring up throughout Mexico. And then things really started going sideways in 1978. Info from both the United States and the Mexican authorities would later reveal that there was a power struggle that emerged between Don Pedro and Felix Gallardo that would ultimately lead to each man plotting a way to seize control for himself. We know that just prior to Don Pedro's death, there was a meeting of leaders of the various plazas that had sprung up in Mexico. 
Gallardo wanted to establish one large group of all of the major drug traffickers. Aviles did not see any need to do that and took particular offense when one of his plaza rivals credited Gallardo for bringing all of the parties together. Regardless, shortly after this meeting, Don Pedro is killed, and to this day, much mystery surrounds how that death went down. The official version is that he was killed in a shootout with law enforcement on September 15, 1978, about six miles outside of Culiacan at a police checkpoint. But there are at least four different versions of what actually happened. In the version that is portrayed on Netflix in Narcos Mexico, Felix Gallardo puts the final bullet in Don Pedro's head. That whole scenario having been set up after a plot by Aviles to kill Gallardo was discovered by Don Neto, who then flipped the script, enabling Gallardo to kill him first. Now, it should be noted that the producers of Narcos have said all along about half of what you see is fact and about half is totally made up. So what really happened? Well, who knows? That's for you to decide and it's beyond the scope of this video. But if you are interested in examining all of the different versions of how he was killed, check out my full length video on Pedro Aviles Perez. Regardless, with the death of Don Pedro, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, Ernesto Fonseco Carrillo Don Neto, and Rafael Caro Quintero Rafa would take over the organization's leadership. And pursuant to that earlier meeting, they coordinated all of the various plazas, their production and operations, and formed the core of what came to be known as the Guadalajara Cartel. And they took slinging dope to the next level. First, they started producing high-quality seedless marijuana called Sensamilla in mass quantities from large multi-acre fields. And really, nobody in history had produced marijuana on this scale before. Don Neto, he was the treasurer, but with his farming knowledge, he was also principally responsible for overseeing the marijuana growing operations, including the creation and cultivation of a 2,500-acre Rancho Buffalo, one of the largest marijuana plantations in the history of the world. It was a marijuana field of about four square miles, and you can't just hide that. And they didn't have to because of Gallardo's bribes of the local Mexican police and his affiliation with the governor of Sinaloa. He simply used his political and law enforcement relationships to protect the Guadalajara cartel. It was also about this time, the early 80s, that the Colombian drug cartels were shoveling massive amounts of cocaine into the United States. And DEA efforts were focused primarily on Florida, which was the major shipping destination for Colombian cartels who were importing tons of cocaine by way of the Bahamas and then up into the Sunshine State. So, to avoid the law enforcement scrutiny in Florida, the Colombian cartels began to utilize Mexico as its primary transshipment point. This was all facilitated through Honduran smuggler Juan Ramon Mata Ballesteros, who was the Guadalajara cartel's primary connection to the Colombian cartels. But now, instead of taking cash payments for their services like Don Pedro did, the Guadalajara cartel would take a cut of the cocaine they were transporting and sell it for themselves. This turned out to be a very profitable action for them. Estimates put the increased profits from the Guadalajara cartel by doing business this way at approximately $5 billion annually. And by the mid-80s, they were also working with someone you may have heard of, Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel, in assisting with trafficking boatloads of cocaine across the United States border. So, drug trafficking in North America in the 80s was dominated by the Guadalajara cartel, who saw legendary traffickers like El Chapo and El Mayo moving up in the organization both of whom have history of videos on my channel if you are interested. It was also during this time that a third major cartel emerged, the Juarez Cartel in Chihuahua, across the border from El Paso, and they were basically doing the same things and even involving many of the same individuals that were with the Guadalajara Cartel. So it's the early 80s and life was good with the GC, really good. 
Don Neto and company were kings, and by now they had acquired hundreds of houses and ranches and were estimated to be worth well over a billion dollars. Don Neto was also known to spend a significant amount of time in the United States. That was until 1982, when he was indicted for money laundering in California. The DEA had actually used his phone and had wiretapped it, and they were very close to moving in on him and arresting him when he fled to Mexico. And this was really where things would start heading south for Don Neto. Not long after, tragedy struck when on February 13th of 1983, his son, Gilberto Fonseca Caro, was gunned down outside a Tijuana sports arena following a boxing match. Reports were that this crushed Don Neto emotionally, which of course it would, that was his son, and it also exacerbated a fairly severe cocaine habit. Drug trafficking in Mexico is and has always been a family affair, and it was no different with Don Neto. So after his son's death, Don Neto found a new protege in his nephew, Amado Carrillo Fuentes. Amado was already working as a pilot for the Guadalajara cartel but was then promoted by his uncle, Don Neto, and sent from Sinaloa to Chihuahua to oversee the cocaine shipments coming in from South America and to manage the distribution among the local plaza bosses. It was from here that he would build a fortune with Juan Mataballesteros and his fleet of planes. There are two major U.S. border crossings in Chihuahua, at Juarez and at Ojinaga, Amado would learn all about border operations from the founders and leaders of the Juarez cartel in each city. Pablo Acosta Villarreal, El Zorro de Ojinaga, or the Ojinaga Fox, was obviously stationed in Ojinaga, and Rafael Aguilar Guajardo was in Juarez. It was from Chihuahua that Carrillo started working with Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel, and then later the Cali cartel, to smuggle lots and lots of cocaine from Colombia to Mexico, and then ultimately into the United States. Now, the only real way to get cocaine from Colombia to Mexico consistently was through the air. So Amado invested in a few airlines and some planes of his own. He used those jets to transport cocaine from Colombia to Mexico and then into the United States and Canada. Now, the concept wasn't new, as pilots like Barry Seal and George Jung had used small planes to fly cocaine into the United States. The problem was Amado needed to move a lot of cocaine. So the planes that Carrillo purchased were full-sized passenger jets that could hold huge amounts of cocaine. And it was this move that would earn him the title El Señor de los Silos, or Lord of the Skies. So Don Neto's promotion of his nephew was obviously viewed as a great success. But back at the Guadalajara cartel, things were about to be turned on their heads. So up until this point, for the most part, they had followed Don Pedro's example of protecting their trade primarily with money and bribes rather than bullets, as much of what they were doing was being protected by local law enforcement, politicians, the Mexican DFS, which was their CIA equivalent back then, and the United States CIA, who was using the Mexican drug trade to secretly fund Ronald Reagan's war against communism in Nicaragua. And that became a very big deal because after the Iran-Contra scandal blew up, it was the only way that Contras were receiving financial support. However, not everybody in law enforcement was on board. The U.S., DEA, and the Mexican military were still seeking to bust drug traffickers. So, in November of 1984, acting on information provided in part by U.S. DEA agent Kiki Camarena, 450 Mexican soldiers backed by helicopters conducted Operation Godfather, and they destroyed Don Neto's Rancho Buffalo. So gone was the 2,500-acre marijuana plantation that had the estimated annual production of billions of dollars. This was an unbelievable blow to the Guadalajara cartel and to the U.S.'s ability through the CIA to fund ongoing operations of the Contras in Nicaragua. And this was the second field that was busted from information from Kiki, so he had become quite the problem. The DEA says that by January of 1985, 
Kiki was extremely close to unlocking a multi-billion dollar drug pipeline involving the CIA, Mexican government officials, politicians, the local police, and the Guadalajara cartel. Needless to say, the GC was making preparations to protect its interests. And in a move, the decision about which is still disputed by cartel leaders to this day, on February 7th, 1985, U.S. DEA agent Kiki Camarena was abducted in broad daylight. Kiki was surrounded by five armed men, Jalisco police officers on the cartel's payroll, who threw him into a car. Camarena was taken to a cartel mansion at 881 Lopa de Vega Drive in western Guadalajara. It is disputed, but some say the property was owned by Rafa. Kiki was beaten, tortured, and interrogated over a 30-hour period. Ultimately, Camarena's body was found almost a month later, wrapped in plastic and ditched next to a ranch in Michoacan or Michoacan, depending upon how you pronounce it. It is a fascinating story with the complicity of the U.S. CIA, but the specifics of that are beyond the scope of this video, so if you are interested, the entire story of Kiki Camarena is also available on this channel. Camarena's torture and murder prompted a swift reaction from the U.S. DEA, which launched Operation Leyenda, or Legend, the largest DEA homicide investigation ever undertaken. The main targets were Felix Gallardo, Rafa, and Don Neto. Rafa would flee Mexico and seek refuge in Costa Rica, but his freedom would last less than 60 days after a girlfriend's call home was traced by authorities. And on April 4th of 1985, Caro Quintero was arrested while sleeping at his Costa Rica mansion and extradited back to Mexico on charges of involvement in Camarena's murder. Don Neto was arrested three days later in Puerto Vallarta on April 7th of 1985 by the Mexican army when his villa was surrounded and he surrendered. And while Mexican officials were fairly quickly able to apprehend Rafa and Don Neto, Felix Gallardo, with his connections, kept a low profile and was protected and even hidden by politicians in Sinaloa and then later in Guadalajara, where he was able to evade arrest for another four years. But on April 8th of 1989, the last of the GC founders was taken into custody. But the show must go on. However, with the big three behind bars, they contemplated that it would be more efficient and less likely to be disrupted by law enforcement if they diversified. So in a meeting set up by Gallardo's lawyer, several of the top narcos in Mexico met in 1989 at a house in Acapulco, where they divided up the GC plazas or territories. The Tijuana route would go to Gallardo's nephews, the Ariano Felix brothers. The Juarez route would stay with the Carrillo Fuentes family, namely Amado, and that's Don Neto's bunch. Miguel Caro Quintero would run the Sonora Corridor, that being Rafa's family. Joaquin Guzman, El Chapo, and Hector Luis Palma were left the Pacific Coast operations with Ishmael Zambala Garcia, El Mayo, eventually joining them. So, it's 1989. We have a whole new way of doing business in narco world with the subdivision of the Guadalajara cartel. In addition, the dismantling of the GC was really the catalyst for exposing the widespread corruption within the political and law enforcement realms in Mexico, as during this time, several police commanders were arrested, with as many as 90 other officers defecting and simply disappearing. So it's the end of an era where money and bribes were used to protect the drug cartels, and is really when things started to bend towards the violence that we see in the Mexican drug trade today, as these new cartels played nice for about 30 minutes. The Tijuana cartel would get the violence ball a rolling by executing Armando Lopez, who was one of El Chapo's right-hand men. And while El Chapo did not respond immediately, within a couple of years, each of the cartels were actively trying to execute members and leaders of the rival groups. It was a mess. Ultimately, in the 30 years that followed the collapse of the Guadalajara cartel, 
These fledgling cartels that first existed would fight and fracture into the nine cartels that currently dominate the Mexican drug trade, with the groups choosing to rely on violence to claim various territories and trafficking routes instead of the bribery that had marked their predecessors. It is these continuing disputes and escalating conflicts that has created the political, social, and military chaos that we now know as the Mexican Drug War. Ultimately, all three of the original GC founders would be tried and convicted of a slew of charges, and each would be sentenced to 40 years in prison, the maximum amount allowed under Mexican law. Don Neto later would admit to being involved with the events surrounding the murder of Kiki Camarena, but he stated that he did not kill Kiki and was outraged that he was tortured. So that's the end of the story, right? Ha, not even close. Don Neto would serve 31 years in prison, but was released to house arrest in 2016 due to his declining health. Ultimately, he was released to straight probation in 2017 and currently lives in a luxurious residence in a suburb of Mexico City. Meanwhile, Rafa would be in prison for over 28 years when, man, luck would be on his side. In the early hours of August 9th of 2013, a Jalisco court ruled that Carol Quintero was tried improperly in a federal courtroom for crimes that should have been tried at a state level. So the magistrate threw out the murder conviction, ruled that Rafa had already served all of his time for the other federal crimes he was convicted of, and ordered his immediate release. As you might suspect, the United States lost its mind. You just let the guy who was convicted of murdering a U.S. DEA agent go? Barack Obama immediately petitioned the Mexican government to act, and they did. Within five days, an arrest warrant was issued for the rearrest of Rafa on additional federal charges in Mexico. But it was too late. He was gone. And they haven't been able to find him since. He is currently on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list, and the U.S. government is offering $20 million for information leading to his capture. That is by far the most money of anybody on the list. And the rumor is he is back in the game and is the head of the brand new drug cartel in Coborca, Sonora, located just south of the state of Arizona. As for Felix Gallardo, he was not so lucky. He sat in prison continually since 1989. As he aged, Gallardo experienced several medical conditions, including deafness, loss of an eye, and circulation problems. In March of 2013, Gallardo launched a legal battle requesting to serve out his prison sentence at home once he reached his 70th birthday. A Mexican federal court denied his petition. However, in 2014, it would approve his request to transfer to a medium security prison in Guadalajara, due to his declining health. And that is where he sits today. And last but not least, what about Don Neto's nephew, Amado? Well, he made it up the ranks in the Juarez cartel, including allegedly killing the leader so that he could seize control for himself. Amado would enjoy enormous success in the 90s, becoming the Mexican drug lord known as El Señor de los Silos, the Lord of the Skies. Interestingly, as law enforcement began to tighten its noose on Amato, he made plans to undergo plastic surgery and liposuction to completely change his identity, making him unrecognizable in Mexico. So on July 4th of 1997, at a posh hospital in Mexico City, Carrillo underwent the knife. After eight hours of surgery, being given anesthetics and a concoction of drugs that the experts would later say contradicted all medical science, Carrillo was alleged to have died on the operating table. And I say alleged because there are many who think that it was just a ploy to aid in his disappearance. But if you want the full story about Amado Carrillo Fuentes or any of the other characters in today's video, they each have their own video on my channel. So check them out. So that is the episode. I hope you have enjoyed going way back into drug cartel history today to see where it all started in Mexico and then pulling it forward through the lens of Don Neto. If you are interested in more information about Ernesto Fonseco Carrillo, he is a major character in the Netflix series Narcos Mexico. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share. 
That's all for today. I'm Joshua Roberts, attorney at law, and you've been watching Lawyer Up. Send lawyers, guns, and money.